Hey, Geo students, it is day nine, and we are going to keep on rolling with proofs. We're almost to the end. So what we are looking at for today, um, the title says corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, which is abbreviated to CPCTC. So it's one of those loving little abbreviations that we can use, but we have to make sure we know when we're allowed to use it. So let's walk through these first few couple examples to explain like how this is useful and when we'd use it. So the first one, you have three givens. AB is congruent to CD, or excuse me, DE, which is already marked for you. AC is congruent to DF, and then angle A and angle D are congruent. So to speed it up, look, you've got it written there already for you. How lovely. So that's a pair of sides, that's a pair of sides, that's a pair of angles. But like you already know, we don't list in the proof the order that it shows up here. We list it the order that it shows up in the diagram. So when I look in the diagram, we've got side angle side right here. So we can go ahead and say that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DEF. We want to make sure that the order matches all the parts. And that's because of side angle side being congruent to side angle side right here. Or you could just put once a little sass. All right. Step three, what we're going to be able to say is once I know the triangles are congruent, what else do you know is congruent? Well, if we knew that there was two sides in an angle, all the other corresponding pieces should also be congruent. So the other parts that match up that we haven't mentioned yet would be angle B up top would have to be congruent to angle E. And it makes sense because it's the middle letter of each. So you want to make sure that those orders make sense. Right. We would also know that angle C, now I'm going to go with a triple straight, would have to be congruent to angle F. Right. And then the one other piece that we haven't mentioned yet is the idea that uh, side BC would have to be congruent to the last pair of sides, or the last side over here, and that's EF. And so our reason for being able to say it is that congruent triangles, so we're using what we said here, implies that it has congruent corresponding, and then we go kind of generic, parts. Rather than saying sides and angles, parts just kind of covers the bases, all right? So congruent triangles, so the fact that we said the triangles are congruent here, so literally congruent triangles means that con has congruent corresponding parts. And now, can you abbreviate that and call it CPCTC? Sure. The CPCTC part of it kind of goes a little out of order the way we wrote it here, but it's saying the corresponding parts of your congruent triangles are congruent. All right. So it, it just worded a little differently, but that would be the other way that you could say your reason in step three here. But that's why congruent triangles means all the parts that match up should be congruent. Same argument for this next one. Here you've got triangles EFG and HIJ are right triangles. Cool. You've got EF congruent to HI and you have FG congruent to IJ. So when you run through those little details, if I have that key step of right triangles, that makes EF and HI the legs and then FG and IJ the hypotenuses, if you will. All right. So when we go to say that triangle, let's look at the order. So if I say like FEJ, or FEG, excuse me, would be congruent to, make sure FEG means I would go IHJ. So if you were to start the first one and say like EFG, then the second one would have to go HIJ. So you have to just make sure that the picture matches, um, that all the parts match up when you list them. And then that would be by hypotenuse leg, congruent to hypotenuse leg, or you could list it once. Um, and then for the third part, what are all the other pieces you now know are congruent? So you should know at this point that angle F has to then be congruent to angle I. Right? And then we would also get angle G, so the last letter here, congruent to angle J, the last letter there. And then we would also get the last pair of sides. We would get E, G congruent to H, J. And then that would be by corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So you can write it either way. If you would like 
to use this because it's kind of short and sweet, go ahead. Otherwise, I want you to remember that what it ultimately stands for is, hey, those congruent triangles means that the corresponding parts are congruent, right? Or you could say it that way, the corresponding parts are congruent, right? So you get a little discretion with how you write it. Just get that point across that you need the triangles congruent first, then all the matching pieces, they must be congruent. All right, let's see how this works to our benefit when we get on over to the next page. Sliding up to the top, make sure you can see, there we go. We have for this first one, CD bisects angle ACB. All right, now I love to jump right to that first given that I forgot to take a look at what the heck are we trying to prove? All right. But this one, we, we want to finish by saying that AC, this here, is congruent to BC. So keep in mind, that's not a given. That's how we're going to finish the proof. So what you have to think of is, is what is the goal here? Those segments are part of which triangles? So off to the side, we want to set a goal to say, this one's nice and easy. We really only have one triangle to work with, or one pair of triangles. So if we can prove that triangle ACD is congruent to triangle BCD, then we're going to easily be able to say this using our CPCTC, okay? So keep that in mind. Our goal is really to get those triangles congruent. So when they start us by saying that CD bisects angle ACB, so it's what's getting bisected, angle ACB, that's what I know this next thing is. So if it's an angle bisector, That means I'm going to end up with two congruent angles. All right, look at your picture. CD comes through and bisects angle ACB. So I've traced out those little angles at the top. Here's a great place to just call those angles one and two. So angle one is congruent to angle two. And right there, bam, there's a pair of angles in those triangles. All right, we've got more to say. Go back to the givens. CD is perpendicular to AB because it's given to us and it's got a nice vocab term in it. So for step four, I'm going to bring that vocab right on down. Perpendicular implies that we've got some right angles. All right, use your diagram. CD right here is perpendicular to AB. Again, it's actually tracing it out right there. So there are my right angles. All right. And if I want to, I can be a little lazy here and I could call this angle three and angle, oops, not angle three and angle three, angle three and angle four. All right. And so I would have to say angle three and angle four are right angles because perpendicular tells me I've got right angles. So I need to make sure that those statements match one another. All right, anytime we have right angles, we have the probability that it could be just like an angle in a triangle or it could be hypotenuse leg. Now, to be honest with you, right now, I already know the answer to that and the reason for it. Look what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that side AC is congruent to BC that would be the hypotenuse of each. So if I know that I'm not going to know that, I can't use it for HL, which means this is just a pair of congruent angles. So let's follow this step with the fact that right angles right here ooh, is going to follow down here. So I can say that right angles implies congruent angles. Now, if you were doing this on your own and you weren't sure, could you do both? Absolutely. You could say that you had congruent angles and you could say that you had right triangles. And I think that would be great. Okay. We have two pairs of congruent angles. We're trying to get those triangles congruent. When you look back at the picture, it's either vertical or reflexive that you can look for. So in this case, it shares that side CD right down the middle. So I can say CD is congruent to CD, which is gonna give me a pair of sides, and that is the reflexive 
property. Ooh, I'm starting to run out of space, but I think I have just enough room because I need two more things I have to say. We have shown enough to say that we have congruent triangles because we have two angles and a side. So when I cover up so that I can focus on just one triangle here, here's two angles and that's the side, oops, I'm so sorry, I'm off the screen, the side in between it. So I've got angle, side, angle right here, okay? So my reason, angle, side, angle, supports me being able to say that triangle ACD is congruent to triangle BCD. All right, once we've tr proved triangles congruent, now we finally get to finish the proof and we can say that AC is congruent to BC and our reason is our newest step. So I can now say AC is congruent to BC and my reason over here is that congruent triangles tells me that the corresponding parts are congruent, or you can absolutely, because I'm kind of out of space here, use corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. All right. And there you go. Um, this next one I think is a good one to take a look at. Let's see space-wise. I just want to make sure that we're okay. Yeah, let's take a look at it. Maybe I'll have to just write my first couple steps a little smaller this time, right? Because that's eight steps. That's a pretty big proof right there. All right, for this one, you've got that D is a midpoint. you got angles one and two in there. We've got a big old isosceles triangle, and we're trying to prove that ED is congruent to FD. So the first thing is you want to write yourself a little goal. ED and FD. You just want to think of what triangles they're a part of. So I would focus on those little triangles here. If I can prove that triangle AED is congruent to this little triangle BFD, then I can say that those parts would be congruent. So that's what I'm going to make my first goal, is getting those little baby triangles congruent. So everything that I stay here, or state here, I want to keep that goal in mind. So D is the midpoint of A, B. And even though I know I might be risking it, I'm going to start with just that one given and say what I can from that. Okay. Here's my vocab term. Midpoint. That's what comes right here. Right. Do you have to highlight it every time? Nope. I just want you to make that connection, that whatever vocab word is here comes right here. So midpoint implies that we should have two congruent segments, and then look at your diagram. Here's my midpoint, there's my two congruent segments. So AD is congruent to DB. That's a pair of sides right there in my triangles. All right. Now I'm gonna use my next given. Angle one's congruent to angle two. And if I mark it, they just hand us a pair of angles right there. So thank you very much. I mean, since there's nothing more to say from that, I'm going to go right into the next given in that same step. So we have isosceles triangle ABC with base AB. All right. So this big triangle is isosceles, and this is the base down at the bottom. All right. So what that means for us. Isosceles triangle can mean a couple different things. Um, it could mean that we get the two big sides congruent, although those would not be parts of the triangle. But if we use the base angles down here, those are parts of the little triangles we're going for. Right? Because it's the only angle there, I can call that angle A and angle B, and that would be perfectly fine. So I can say angle A is congruent to angle B. And now here's my vocab. The isosceles triangle part comes right on over here. So an isosceles triangle implies that we have two congruent base angles. And right there, that's another pair of angles inside the little triangles I want. Now, could you have highlighted those little triangles to start so that you could focus in on them? Sure, absolutely. Right? That's, again, where those nice colored pencils can kind of come in handy as you're working through these proofs. But if you look... We now have two angles and a side here, two angles and a side here. And even though they're tiny, tiny little pictures, the side is not between the angles. So that's going to be an angle, angle, side case right there. So we've already got 
congruent triangles by angle, angle, side. So let me uncover. And you might want to double check, did the order of the letters that you wrote it here make sense? So if I say angle AED, or excuse me, triangle AED, I went from the two stripe angle to the one stripe to nothing. Over here, I need to make sure I do the same thing. Two stripes, one stripe, nothing. So BFD makes complete sense here. By angle, angle, side. And now that I have the triangles congruent, now I can say what we're aiming for. We wanted to prove that ED is now congruent to FD. And we can because congruent triangles implies that the corresponding parts are congruent. So each time I wrote it down, did I write it a little different? Yeah, because it doesn't fully matter exactly where the congruent goes, or if I choose to use the abbreviation, what matters is the reasoning behind it. So if it throws you off that I've written it a little different, stick with CPCTC, all right? That will work every single time. But you do have to make sure that you get the order of the letters correct. And then if I ask you, what does it stand for? You know what it stands for. So corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Right. Because our next class together is a short one, um, I'm going to go on and do one more of these in our, our video notes today. So let's do number four. Oops, I said four and then I started to write a four. So let's take a look at what we're working with. We've got HJ congruent to IG, HJ and IG, okay? And then HG over here congruent to IJ. And what you're going to try to prove is angle. HIG is congruent to angle, IHJ. Well, as a little hint, when you have things that overlap, especially, and it can get a little confusing to understand what you're looking at, if you're asked to prove that this pair of angles are congruent, that's pretty much code for those are the triangles that you need to be congruent. So change the angle symbol to triangle and make it triangle HIG needs to be congruent to triangle IHJ and make that your goal, all right? And I'm gonna outline those. So HIG is this triangle here. Mm -hmm. And then IHJ, ooh, so some things to take note of. I can see where it's overlapping. So your brain should already be thinking maybe one or two steps ahead as to like, what can we say with all this? All right. Um, if you want to redraw it, you certainly can. I know I don't have a ton of room here, but I might like really teeny tiny just redraw mine. Because for me, that helps. So here's H, I, and then J. And then if I redraw my little guy over here, This is H, I, and then G. All right, so now we've got our setup ready to go. So the first two givens that you're handed don't have any vocab, which means I'm gonna put them both up here. So H, J, where the heck is that, is congruent to I, G, all right? So that's a pair of sides in my triangles. And I'm gonna put the other pair of sides right with it. So H, G, is congruent to IJ. HG, that's this. Congruent to IJ, that's that. All right, so I just didn't mark the big part in the picture because with the overlap, it gets a little confusing. Um, but if I look at the triangle separately, you can immediately see they're just giving you two pairs of congruent sides here and here, which is kind of nice. Um, and so as we were drawing and outlining with the red and blue, I said we had an overlap. When you have an overlap, that's code for hopefully we've got a little reflexive property going on. And we do. Side HJ at the top is shared in both triangles. So, or excuse me, HI. So we can say HI is congruent to HI just using the reflexive property. And so that's a third pair of sides right there. So right there, three steps in and we've got our triangles congruent. So triangle HIG, oops. So HIG is congruent to triangle IHJ. 
And that's why it's nice to write the little goal first because then it's ready to go for you. And that is by side, 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 congruent to side, side, side. All right. And if the sides are congruent, then so are all the corresponding angles. So then the angle pair that we cared about is the one that they're asking you to prove right here. So that means that angle HIG has to be congruent to angle IHJ, and that would be by corresponding parts of congruent. Triangles are congruent. All right. Let's save just that last one for class for tomorrow. And so what I want you to make sure that we take away from all this is that when you are trying to use um, congruent triangles to prove the parts congruent, it's a great idea to set up that goal of what triangles are we trying to prove congruent first and then go from there. All right. See you guys tomorrow in class.